Steve Aiken, is the founder and the co-director of the Humanitarian Disaster Institute at Wheaton College. And if anyone's personal experience qualifies them for that type of a job, it's Jamie. In August of 2005, uh, Jamie moved to South Mississippi just six days before Hurricane Katrina made landfall. Some years later, another kind of storm struck him. Stage four, colon cancer. Unlike Katrina, though, there was no way to evacuate from that. As Aiton writes in an article for the Washington Post, I was a walking disaster. From his research on disaster survivors, Aiton observed that most of us operate from what some researchers refer to as a just worldview. We tend to believe that if we are good, good things will happen. It's difficult then to make meaning when bad things happen to us. Aiton now found himself operating from that same worldview. He writes, thoughts like, wasn't I a good person? Plagued me. Thoughts that made his experience of hardship even worse. Meanwhile, he writes, a colleague of mine deployed to help with a relief agency after Superstorm Sandy, and she met a man whose roof blown away by gale strength winds. This man surprised the relief team with an optimistic quip. Sometimes you have to lose the roof, he said, to see the stars. While Aiton's perspective on things was making his experience of hardship even worse, somehow this roofless man's perspective on things had the opposite effect. Aiton writes, my colleagues and I have interviewed and surveyed disaster survivors about their views of God in the wake of catastrophe. We have found that you can have two people who go through almost identical losses with one believing God saved them, while the other believes God is punishing them. Remember, they went through the same disaster, but as Aiton writes, we found that the person who doesn't find positive meaning, the one whose perspective doesn't give that to them, is likely to struggle a great deal more. What makes all the difference in the midst of the trials and the hardships of life is your perspective. Now, most of us will never experience a natural disaster or a stage four cancer diagnosis, but Jesus' followers face other hardships, uh, some of them the same as, as everybody else. It's that rejection that you received from that employer that didn't hire you, the school that didn't admit you, the romantic interest that did not return the same, the ability to do something that you never had or had been lost, the relationship that was broken, that chronic illness, that chronic pain, or just simply the unmet needs and longings that leave us wondering why life seems easier for other people. And yet some hardships are precisely because we follow Jesus. Greg talked about a number of those last week. If you weren't here, you can find that on the website on our sermons page. But your perspective in the midst of all of these things will either make things better for you or worse. So this morning, we're going to look at a portion of Scripture written to a community of Jesus followers that were enduring incredible hardships, and the perspective that they needed for the kinds of things they were dealing with are exactly the same things we need today. After a whole chapter about those who had gone before us in this journey of faith, we pick up in chapter 12. In the Bibles in your pews in front of you, it's page 1877. This is God's Word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everybody undergoes discipline, you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. 
how much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make a level path for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. So what do we see in here? Obviously, more than we can address in any one sermon. But in the midst of the hardships of life, Hebrews offers a helpful perspective by inviting us to see three things. First, inviting us to see the Christian life as a race. Verse 1, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Meaning there is a course to run, there is a goal, there is a destination. And those who run races have purposes. And so do Jesus' followers. So what kind of race? Running against what? Well, first of all, it's not about an individual running against other runners. Before I ran my first 5K road race, I asked an older runner for advice, and he said, Keith, run fast, pass people. And it wasn't exactly the advice I was looking for, and it's not what Hebrews is talking about either. You see, the Christian life is not about doing better than somebody else. Often, unfortunately, religion is seen as striving to be one of the good people, which inevitably leads you to measure yourself against others. I was doing that in college myself when my goal as a runner on the cross-country team was to beat one of my teammates who had an athletic scholarship so that I could earn one for myself. From that perspective, if they had a bad day and I finished ahead of them, that was probably a bad day for our team. But it was a good day for me. You see, it was a horrible perspective to have. And fortunately, trying to outdo another is not what this passage is talking about not what following Jesus is about. It's not about an individual achievement. In a sense, it's actually about the team. Let us run the race marked out for us. Also, in the days where you told time by sundials and hourglasses, they probably weren't racing the clock either. Uh, Nobody back then could tell you what their mile time was. You see, in this image, the challenge to be overcome is, is not another runner. It is not the clock. It's the course itself, the struggles and the hardships of life. The goal was to keep going, to finish the race. So the exhortation is not run with speed or pass people, but run with perseverance, or as other versions translate it, endurance. You see, if the Christian life is to be thought of as a race, an endurance race, it is one where perseverance, keeping at it despite the hardships along the way, is of utmost importance. A lot less like a 100-meter sprint and a lot more like a 26-mile marathon. The most famous of which is the Boston Marathon. And if you've heard anything about Boston, you've probably heard about Heartbreak Hill. Starting at mile 13 of the course, there are a number of hills climaxing at mile 19 with Heartbreak Hill, the longest and the steepest hill in the race. But what makes it even worse is that even world-class runners can hit the wall around mile 18 or 19. That is, their bodies have depleted the glycogen stored in their muscles, the body's preferred energy source. Now that glycogen has been replaced with lactic acid, which is as painful as it sounds. As a result, the muscles are now screaming for oxygen. An article in Runner's World magazine describes it like this. You feel like you've just run face first into a brick wall. Your legs simultaneously feel like they're made of jelly, but they also weigh eight tons each. Each step is an absolute triumph of will, and you start to seriously doubt that the race even climbs. Seeing the Christian life as a marathon is, is actually a fitting image because there are heartbreak hills in life. Life is not on a level grade. We have problems. We have bigger problems, and sometimes we face heartbreak hill. Sometimes life feels just like one hill after another, one trial after another, where every step forward feels like it takes all that you've got. And like a runner hitting that wall on heartbreak hill, you can experience the very things verse 3 is talking about. Growing weary, losing heart, losing the very thing that keeps you going. 
but it's worth noting that one of the signs that you're about to hit the wall, that, that weariness that leads to losing heart is coming, is actually your vision, how you see things. See, that same article uh, states that if your vision is delayed or blurred, the wall is coming unless you address the root cause. In a similar way, the weariness that can lead to spiritually losing heart can be treated by addressing what's behind blurred spiritual vision, the perspective from which you see things. And so those who might otherwise grow weary and lose heart are invited to see this Christian life as a race, as a marathon, as an endurance race. But to do so means seeing things the way that a runner sees them, to adopt a runner's perspective. And those who know what it takes to make it in an endurance race know that you don't want to be carrying any dead weight. And so we read, let us throw off everything that hinders, literally every weight or every bulk. Back when I was living in the southeast, I was part of a running club that one member affectionately called the Skinny Naked Guys Club. Now, it's not that any of us actually ran that way. Okay, we ran skinny, yes. Um, but we wore clothes, just not more than we had to. There was no excess weight. Shirts get really heavy when you start to sweat in them, especially in the southeast where nothing evaporates, and so we'd often leave those behind. When I ran a race in Alaska in the fall, we wore pants and jackets all week long while playing tourist and even during our warm-ups. But when we towed that starting line with the temperatures not quite in the 40s, the pants and the jackets came off and we just ran in our shorts and our jerseys. Not because we liked the temporary discomfort, but because we knew that those things would weigh us down, restrict our motion, and on that windy day actually hold us back. You see, this was the 90s, the era of parachute pants, where everybody thought they were size XL in their shirts and jackets, and so our loose-fitting warm-up jackets and pants would have caught the wind like a sail, pushing us backwards with every headwind, pushing us off the course with every crosswind. And so we'd throw up everything that we'd see as hindering us in the race, and that's the perspective we need for the Christian life. As New Testament scholar William Lane puts it, throwing off what hinders refers to anything that would hinder responsible commitment to Jesus or freedom for Christian action. It means reconsidering things like your commitments, your, your associations. It means asking what in your life is like a 90s tracksuit, something that can offer comfort against the cold winds that might come your way, but like a sail only magnify the force of anything pushing against your spiritual progress, pushing you back or blowing you off course. It means asking, what's weighing me down spiritually? Is it bitterness? Unforgiveness? Are there relationships that make it harder for me to live out my commitment to Jesus and the things that he values? You see, if you realize that your life of faith isn't what it once was, it means asking What's been throwing you off course? What's distracting you? And yet having this perspective also means throwing off the sin that so easily entangles. You see, when something becomes more important to you than God, whether comfort, pleasure, status, success, or security, or whatever, and you find that you're willing to do anything to have that, even if God says no, that is sin. That word translated entangles refers to something that wraps itself around another, like, like a snake curls itself around its prey, or the dog that I once had to run away from when it tried to wrap its paws and its jaws around my leg. See, this translation carries the sense of something trying to trip you up, uh, but the word itself carries the added sense of something entangling you in order to control you. You see, when sin is in control, you are not. You're not doing your own bidding. You're actually doing its bidding. And it will knock you off course. Another pastor once shared how when people fall into habitual sins or back into addictive behaviors, they tend to disappear from his church. Their guilt and their shame actually holding them back from the very community that they desperately need. Some may actually want to be free from sin's control, but aren't yet willing to do what it takes to untangle themselves from it. Some of you have heard the story uh, about a professing Christian who'd become a part of a church's singles ministry. 
one day he sat down with his uh, new pastor and, and, and confessed his sexual sin. How he'd go out to a club, sleep with somebody he had just met with, and then wake up the next morning not even knowing her name. And when asked how often this had happened, he started doing some quick math, and he said, about 500 times by now. So his pastor asked him, how does it happen? Like, do you still go to the same clubs? And he says, no, now they call me. If I ever gave somebody my number, they, they still have it. So his pastor told him, well, I know what you need to do. You need to get a new phone number. And he said, whoa, hey, I can't do that. You know, all my business contacts, they only have this number. You see, even when he was no longer seeking out the sin that so easily entangled him, it still found him because he was unwilling to pay a potential financial cost to be free. What's weighing you down as a follower of Jesus? What sin is likely to trip you up? That's what has to go even if it comes with hardship, because you see that it's worth it. That's how you run the race. And maybe that sounds crazy to you. And if so, I get it. I mean, people think runners are, are crazy too. Runners are just different. They, they see things totally differently. When people hear that you're a runner, they eventually ask you, so like, what do you do when it's like snowing or, or raining or, or really cold outside? And you're like, well, we run anyway. You see, when your entire sport is one where discomfort is expected, things that might stop others in their tracks just don't land the same for you. In the same way, the hardships and trials are expected for followers of Jesus, including the hardship that comes from resisting temptation, from fleeing sin. See, Jesus never promised comfort, telling his followers to expect quite the opposite at times. And your expectations make all the difference in how you experience hardship. Some years ago, I got to meet a, a pastor who, who once said, half or more of the pain that you experience when difficulties happen are due to the shock and the confusion that they're happening to you. He tells the story of when his father had surgery. Before he got to see him, an ICU nurse told him, here's what it's going to look like. He's going to look pale. There will be tubes. You may not recognize him. And the reason why they said all those things was because you're either going to walk into that room with those expectations and say, yep, that's kind of what I expected, or you're going to walk in and say, not as bad as I thought. But back in the day before they would have somebody adjust your expectations for you, people would walk into the exact same scene in the same room and just faint on the spot. The only difference was their perspective coming into it popular author and speaker, Brene Brown, once described what she called a breakdown that propelled her to go back to church. But in the video interview, she said, I definitely went back to church for all the wrong reasons. I really went because this is hard, and this hurts, and in all the midlife unraveling books, they say, go back to church. That's what everybody does. So I went back to church thinking it would be like an epidural, like it would take the pain away and then I discovered that faith and church was not like an epidural at all. It was more like a midwife who just stood next to me and said, push, it's supposed to hurt. As another pastor put it, the basic premise of religion is that if you live a good life, things will go well with you, similar to what those researchers I mentioned called a just worldview. But if you believe that, then hardship will be even harder for you. Either because you assume hardship has only come to you as karma, uh, as a retribution for something that you've done, meaning you deserve this. Or you believe you don't deserve it. You deserve a better life than this, and the fact that you're experiencing hardship for no apparent reason just leads you to despair. But instead of either of those things, the author of Hebrews offers a different perspective, inviting us to see hardship as discipline. Verse 7, endure hardship as, as discipline. Ten times in this passage, we see that, that same word, this discipline. But the intent of it is found in verse 11, where it talks about discipline for those who have been trained by it. So we're invited to see hardship as discipline and, and discipline as training. And that's easier to do when you see things from the perspective of the runner. 
one of the oddities of being an endurance runner is that our entire sport consists of what in other sports is seen as punishment. For example, when I was on the basketball team, if you were late or you missed too many free throws in practice, you had to run. But I was never uh, late to a cross-country practice and seen any told to go grab a basketball and, and shoot hoop. It just doesn't work the same way. You see, from what one perspective is considered a punishment, from a runner's perspective is, is considered training. And you know where it's hardest to train? The mountains. At high altitude, the thin air has less of the oxygen that your muscles need, which means that your body has to work harder to go as far or as fast. And do you know how your body responds to that type of hardship and exertion? It gets stronger. It gets more efficient. It makes more of the red blood cells that your body needs not only for race day, but for every day. And so you want to guess where even professional runners go to get even better? The mountains. The reality is those with the most strenuous training tend to be the most resilient in the race, whether on the race course or in the race of life. And sometimes, God takes us to the mountains. But in the middle of this passage, we actually see a switch in the metaphor from God as our coach to God as our Father. Verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his Father? From that Greek word translated discipline, which is paideia, we, we get our word pediatrician, those who care for the health and the growth of children. That's a common term for child rearing, through instruction, through training, and through correction, which means that the discipline Jesus' followers experience, though painful at times, is never about retribution, but always about how we grow. Training as a parent trains up their child in the way that they should go, which sometimes means learning hard lessons. And the reason that we need this perspective on the hardships of life is that they are painful. Verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Let me tell you from experience, no toddler likes being put in time out after hitting another child. And the way they might scream could convince you they were being tortured by being put in that chair for two whole minutes. And yet it's far more pleasant than that child avoiding discipline, avoiding the lessons they might learn, only to grow up still hitting people and be put in jail for two years for assault. And while sadly, sometimes parents discipline their children for less than pure reasons, with less than righteous means. Verse 10 reminds us that God disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness, becoming like him, that we might grow in holiness, giving us only what we need for our growth and never an ounce more. And yet this isn't the only place in Scripture that talks about uh, greater growth through hardship. There's In John 15, Jesus uses the imagery of, of a plant being pruned, process of, of cutting some branches to remove disease or to be able to bear more fruit. It was missionary Helen Rosevear who compared her experience of suffering to being whittled into an arrow, uh, being shaped for a purpose through a painful process. We know from the, the study of the human body that exercise and, and weight-bearing exercises like running actually increase bone mass, um, making them stronger, making them more resistant to fractures. You see, the strain that your bones experience actually stimulates their growth, just like the strain on your, your muscles from lifting heavy weights stimulates their growth. And in fact, there are, there are so many examples that show us that, that coming up against your limits, physical or otherwise, though often painful, by design grows you. And it's not entirely different in the spiritual realm. Some years ago, I... Uh, uh, in the springtime, I, I found myself at my limits. I was a full-time uh, student at, at Covenant Seminary. I was serving as an intern and doing my field education hours here. I was working two jobs to pay for my tuition and my living expenses. But I wasn't able to do it all. I was getting way behind in my studies. And even though every day, if I was not asleep, I was at work or studying. Spring break just felt like a week of catch-up time. And I knew something had to give. 
Either I needed to continue as I was and trust God to provide more hours in the day, or I had to quit one of my jobs and trust God to provide financially in a way that I just didn't see yet. So on a Friday, I quit one of my jobs, knowing exactly how much money I just lost for that semester. The next day, I was DJing a wedding reception at the lowest budget venue I had ever worked. And at the end of the night, not only did they have actually the money to pay me, but they handed me the biggest tip I had ever seen. I held in my hands what it would have taken weeks for me to get back to my other job. And in 24 hours, God had already provided a third of the money I'd lost when I quit that job. And I'd find out a few days later, he was not done yet. So on a Sunday of that weekend, I was sitting in that back pew with my arm around the back of it, just kind of thinking, why, why do I try to do so much? And, I, and it just kind of hit me. You know, I, I don't like feeling stretched to my limits or feeling constantly stressed out, but what I do like is seeing myself as the guy that can bite off more than others could chew. It was my pride that was keep, help keeping me holding on to that extra job. And yet, if anything had to go, it wasn't just the job, it was my pride. See, God had to let me feel the tension of hitting my limits to expose my own tendency to trust in my own efforts rather than in Him while also inviting me into obedience in a way that I'd never even considered before, all to teach me that I am a finite creature serving an infinite God, not an infinite creature serving a finite God. My perspective needed adjusting. Old ways of seeing things had to be thrown off. And while not every hardship that comes our way is because we need to learn something or to steer us away from sin, when hardships do come, it is worth asking, is there something that needs to be thrown off? Maybe for you, it's also pride. Sometimes suffering is worse because we feel the added burden of anger due to the assumed reason for someone's actions, but we don't give ourselves the opportunity to be proven wrong. Sometimes it's worse because of despair. We can't see a good reason for what we're experiencing, and, and so we assume there just can't be one. But both perspectives flow from a lack of humility, losing sight of where we are finite, we presume to be omniscient, infinite in our knowledge, whether about other people or about the world that we live in. And yet that perspective makes our suffering worse. And if we're trying to put our hardships into a healthy perspective, this is the passage we need to be looking at. Because the author of Hebrews also invites us to see who has gone before us. That's what that great cloud of witnesses is talking about in, in chapter, in verse 1, referring to the people mentioned in, in Hebrews 11, who are those who have already run, who have already finished the race, including those who suffered greatly along the way. As William Lane notes, a witness is never merely a spectator. He is a participant who pledges his life to validate what he has seen and experienced. Just like those mentioned in the previous chapter, often called the Hall of Faith, they speak with a vibrant voice to believers in all ages. Just as the author of that Runner's World article advised marathon runners to focus on the crowd, to help them mentally, the author of Hebrews directs our focus to those who ran before us and who have finished the race, reminding us we are not alone in this. Many have gone before us, and others are running right alongside with us. But most of all, we're pointed to the one mentioned in verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, or as some have translated it, the founder and the finisher, the one where our faith, where this race both begins and ends. First, because of what he endured, what he persevered through. Verse 3 tells us to consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, whatever we've endured because of other people's sins, Whatever we think is too much to bear, Jesus endured even more. From betrayal to abandonment to slander, poverty, even the unjust death of a loved one, Jesus endured it, and he kept going. But he also kept going in the face of temptation. Verse 4 talks about our struggle against sin. It's been said that in our fallen world, we are bo all both sinner and sinned against. 
And in the midst of the pain that comes from being sinned against, or just the hardship of everyday life, you probably have noticed that it's hard not to respond to others in sin. In his book, Union with Christ, Franklin Wilburn writes, In our pain, there is a temptation to prefer our own will above God's will for us, which is the temptation even our Lord faced. And yet Jesus went his whole life without once yielding to the temptation to sin. He finished the race, always holding firm to his heavenly Father in faithfulness, even to the bloody end. Verse 4 continues, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. But Jesus did. You see, what Jesus endured wasn't just during the race, but at its end. As one who, verse 2, tells us, endured the cross. See, whatever we might face in the race, Jesus faced more because his battle against sin wasn't just in his life, but also in his death. You see, on the cross, Jesus took upon himself all the punishment that sin deserved, not for his own sin, because he had none, but for others who would trust in him, assuring those whose faith is in Jesus that in our own suffering, it is never God's punishment for sin, because Jesus already took all our punishment. Christ is showing us that no life, not even the best one, not even his life, is exempt from pain and, and, and hardship. So why did he come? Why did he get in the race? If Jesus didn't have to endure all of that, why did he endure it? For joy. Verse 2, for the joy set before him, Jesus not only came to this world, but endured the cross, scorning, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, the most honored seat in the greatest throne room of all, the greatest honor of all. God honored Jesus' faithfulness to the end, bestowing glory and honor in the presence of the Father, far above any earthly prize or pleasure. And it's with that finish line before him, with that perspective, that Jesus ran the race. But that wasn't all he was running for. In John 17, Jesus prays perhaps his most famous prayer. And in that prayer, what does he pray for? Could, what more could he possibly want to have in the presence of God that wasn't already there? Us. You see, because of our sin, we were by nature objects of God's wrath, natural-born enemies of God, people with no place in the presence of God. You see, in the race of life, telling someone to run faster and pass people is never going to get to the root of the actual problem. And so Jesus came to earth and ran the race himself, living the perfect, sinless life that we should have lived but couldn't, and then dying on the cross as a substitute for all who would trust, not in themselves, but in him, offering to make them his natural-born enemies into his family, where we too could know God as our Father, and thus be welcomed as he was welcomed, re receiving the reward of faithfulness. And if you believe that, it changes your perspective about the hardships and trials in life, the ones that Jesus both faced before us and for us. As another pastor put it, in Jesus' suffering, he was seeking us. And knowing that is why in our suffering, we seek Jesus. That is what fuels us for the race. Well, she had never done a full marathon, but by the end of the day, you could say she had done two. Her friend had invited her on a bike ride, giving her a chance to enjoy a brand new bike. But her friend wasn't the most detail-oriented person. She liked to go with the flow and the feel of things, what she thought things looked like on the map. So she was pretty sure that their turnaround point was just around the next bend. Okay, it's around the next bend. Okay, really, it's around the next one. And so when they finally got to their turnaround point, she was already noticeably tired, and the GPS said she had just ridden 26 miles, the same distance as marathon runners run. But the thing was, that was just the halfway mark. It was still another 26 miles back to their vehicle. It so wiped her out that she spent the next four days just lying on her couch. But the reason it was such a hardship for her body wasn't apparent until weeks later. 
Unbeknownst to her, there was a stowaway on her trip, one that didn't take up much space or, or carry much weight, but got first dibs on all of her nutrients. The whole 52 miles, she was pedaling for two. She was pregnant. And so what at first she experienced as an inexplicable hardship was actually due to a beautiful process of unseen growth happening within her that she wasn't even aware of at the time. I mention that because like that bike ride, sometimes the things that we endure last longer than expected. And as we feel the effects of it all, the author of Hebrews is pointing us to the often unseen growth happening in the midst of it. That we might share in God's holiness and as it eventually produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it, something beautiful that often takes time to see with our own eyes. Speaking of which, eight months later, she got to meet her little stowaway from that 52-mile bike ride, what God had been growing in her, even when all she could see was her fatigue. And so after 21 hours of labor, what did she call to, what did she call this little one now invited to her family, this little one now set before her? Joy. And as she looked upon the joy set before her, someone that she would do anything for, she could understand even more how Jesus was willing to endure the hardships necessary to be able to welcome us into his family. For the joy set before him for you. Let me pray for us.